So I think Emily kind of made my job much easier by explaining what Muay Thai is and all the benefits that women can experience from Muay Thai. So my 20 minutes gets a little bit more full and I can pull in some of our experiences um, adapting this practice of trauma-informed martial arts to the Global South, where we're going to use the, the example of working in El Salvador. But really here what I want to talk about is trauma as a barrier for participation for women in martial arts and the way that we can use trauma-informed practice to try and break down some of those barriers. I acknowledge that this panel has been very skewed towards women's experience in terms of gendered experiences and I do think that particularly in the trauma-informed space where I find myself most of the time there's a real lack of approaches that are considering men and boys experiences here and I would love to have conversations with folks who are interested in that. But as an aside here we're really going to talk about the traumatic experiences for women and gender diverse people and how that prohibits their participation in combat sports. Before I start, though, I want to acknowledge that all my work is conducted on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people here with us today. We're talking about trauma, so if you need to take a break, please do so. So a key source of trauma that our participants experience we call gender-based violence. And this is broadly violence that is perpetrated by someone towards somebody else because of their gender, which to me sounds very vague. And so the way that I really bring it home is to think about experiences or types of violence that we're more familiar with. So we can really look at gender-based violence like an umbrella term for things like family violence, domestic violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault that can occur behind closed doors or can occur in the street perpetrated by strangers. But overwhelmingly, gender-based violence is perpetrated by men towards women. And when we think about the martial arts setting, even when we're not running trauma-informed programs, statistically, the women in our spaces are likely to have experienced violence. These are Australian statistics, but they're mirrored around the world. Um, and we're very correct in currently screaming, I think, at governments at saying that this is a crisis that can no longer be ignored. So we set up the Conscious Combat Club in response to gender-based violence. So it is a trauma-informed kickboxing program. And I tend to say kickboxing because it makes more sense to people than Muay Thai, but we do practice Muay Thai. We do use some elbows. Um, that can enable women to experience an embodied transformation to improve their confidence, um, their self-worth, their experiences of themselves through trauma-informed kickboxing. So trauma-informed practice is relatively new, especially in the martial arts world. We have experiences, uh, we have examples in trauma-informed yoga, there's trauma-informed weightlifting, um, and they all utilise a set of principles that were set out by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Association of the US, um, and those are on well, my right, your left-hand side of the screen. I think they're a bit of a mouthful, so I've taken those principles and made them a little bit simpler and easier um, to roll off the tongue. So we have safety, trust, support, collaboration, and respect. So these are the things that an organisation that's looking to reduce barriers for women who are trauma survivors to participate in their martial art can address. So firstly, safety. How can we help participants feel safe enough to join our programs. We can never guarantee safety, and also we can alienate our audience by saying, this is a safe space, you know, you are safe here. It doesn't always resonate for people who either haven't experienced safety before, or may not go on to experience safety within our spaces. But we can take action to make people feel safer and safe enough to participate. So that might look like having an initial consultation where we really go through, here's what's going to be involved in the classes. It looks like taking your typical martial arts gym, maybe a lot of the colour or shade of black, um, maybe some pretty strong imagery on the walls, oftentimes no windows, and thinking about how we can flip that and move into light-filled spaces where there are signs of life 
through plants and things like that, that create a more inviting environment for participants to step into. In building trust in trauma-informed practice, we really stick to what we say we're going to do at the start of class. So we'll outline, in today's session, we are going to go through a warm-up where we might connect to different parts of our legs. We're then going to use those legs to attempt to learn a roundhouse kick. We're going to do a few structured activities. We're going to play a game called Pound and Ground, which if you come along tomorrow, I'll explain tomorrow in the practical what Pound and Ground is. Um, and then we're going to do a reflection. Then I will follow that within the program, within that class. And I think as martial artists, my experience has been a lot of teachers get excited by tangents. Um, somebody asks a question, they're like, oh my god, great question, let's change the whole structure of the class to answer that because how wonderful. But for trauma survivors, they're really reliant a lot of the time on knowing this is what I'm expecting, this class has followed that expectation. Support in trauma-informed practice, I think, is one of the most undervalued things, and it relates to the relationships that form between participants. I think Emily spoke about this with how these women were able to form connections because of the vulnerability of participating in martial arts. In trauma-informed settings that are explicitly trauma-informed, we're letting people know this is a space for survivors. So you don't need to justify your past experiences to bring up in conversation, I was really scared of coming along to this class, right? And other people will echo that. Or even more specific to trauma experiences, I've had participants say things like, I was totally disconnected from my shoulders, from my whole body, but today when I was throwing a hook, I could feel the connection, I could feel the fatigue in my shoulder. And that's something that they'll share which is met with affirmation from the rest of the group. Right? So it creates these opportunities to discuss our shared difficulty without needing to talk about what happened, without needing to share in traumatic detail. Collaboration is the underpinning of trauma-informed practice. It really relates to Emily's work in self-determination. And in trauma-informed practice, we go a step further by making everything an invitation. This is the key difference in a trauma-informed class, everything is prefaced by things like, if you like, when you're ready, you might like to, and we do a lot of education with clients to remind them that those are not tokenistic words that we're using. We really mean you can say no, or you can modify the practice so long as you're not going to injure somebody else or yourself. That's encouraged, right? Trauma is the absence of choice, and so trauma-informed practice must restore that. Um, and we have a really beautiful opportunity to do that by just slightly changing what we do, by adding invitations to um, our instructions, rather than being, I'm the black belt, you're the participant, do what I say. And finally, respect relates to this whole panel, right? We're talking about gendered experiences, and those can be quite unique. So, for example, somebody who's experienced gender-based violence as a woman likely doesn't want to participate in kickboxing if there's men in the class. Um, and Alex's work has really highlighted the need for gender-segregated spaces. In the work that we do when we think about working with survivors of gender-based violence, we're also looking at the intersection of trans women's experiences um, and how they've often been barred from martial arts spaces. We work with non-binary people who identify with womanhood and we think about the barriers that they might be experiencing to participating. Do we have all gender bathrooms? Do we share our pronouns at the beginning of the class, for example? We then take all of this, all of these ideas we've built up around what is trauma-informed practice, what is trauma, how does it relate, it's so new and I think we're at this really exciting point in time where we don't have to go too far um, down the road of embedding trauma-informed ideas into martial arts without thinking about how colonial these ideas are. And what I mean by that is the idea of trauma is very much rooted in something traumatic happened in the past and it's impacting me negatively in the present. And so the skills that we're working on for folks in trauma-informed kickboxing the three things that I'll tell participants that they're likely to improve when they join our classes are 
setting boundaries, connecting to their bodies, and regulating their nervous system. And I think about how these skills are very important for everybody to cultivate because we've got people who have experienced something in the past that is now negatively impacting them in the present. And so, for example, a small trigger can cause their nervous system to become dysregulated and they need to use grounding skills to come back and to calm themselves down. Their bodies have been unsafe. So interoception means our ability to connect and sense our body. Their bodies have been unsafe. How can we help them, now that their bodies are technically safe, to connect to their bodies once again? And they weren't able to set boundaries in the past, but now that they're away from you know, an, ab an abusive, coercively controlling person, how can they start setting boundaries again? And I think about all of these questions in the context of people who live with ongoing violence, as opposed to people who have past violence negatively impacting them today. Trauma is a barrier for women and gender diverse people's participation in martial arts. But what about people experiencing ongoing trauma? So in 2022, the Conscious Combat Club travelled to El Salvador um, to facilitate trauma-informed kickboxing classes for women in a rural, underserved community. We ran 12 classes over four weeks, so two classes per week um, and an informal third class that was essentially like an open mat, utilising our usual trauma-informed framework. And it was a really beautiful opportunity to learn what we could from working in a different culture and also understanding what we can take from the global south and bring to the global north. So I have hammered on about a lot. I'm very mindful that everything in the Western scholarship of what is trauma, what is post-traumatic stress disorder, describes trauma as something that's been in the past, negatively impacting us in the present. Um, and so some of the coping strategies that people are using might be benefiting them in the present. And so we don't necessarily want to undo all of that work. And I don't have the perfect answer for that. And I think ongoing violence doesn't just impact people in the global south. There are many, many people around the world in every country experiencing ongoing trauma who participate in martial arts. So what that looks like, I'd love to see somebody really dig into how that looks from a decolonial perspective. We also learned a lot from the women that we worked with in terms of how gender impacts their participation in classes. So many women have caregiving roles, have traditionally gendered caregiving roles. And so we had children participating in our classes. Trauma-informed classes where we're talking about trauma, oftentimes you might think, well, maybe we don't want to necessarily have kids there. But having the children as part of the class meant that there were fewer barriers for women um, participating. It meant that the community was really involved and we've learned that a year into the future, the little girls who were participating in these classes and now the ones who teach all of the little boys in the community how to do their hand wraps and how to do a jab and a cross and we have this like matriarchal ownership of kickboxing knowledge in a community that had had no exposure to martial arts before um, we were lucky enough to visit them. They also run classes quite flexibly. I think a lot of countries use this language of Salvadoran time, I've heard Brazilian time, Indonesian time. I don't think it's unique to El Salvador, but certainly there they spoke a lot about we're running on Salvadoran time. And that just meant if we say we're starting at 12, we could start anywhere between 12 and 1. Um, and I think it's easy to feel that this is a sign of disrespect when being on time is such a value. It's one of our values of the conference. I think it's important. Um, but in terms of participation in martial arts, I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience, but have you ever been running 10 or 15 minutes late to a class and then you get stuck in extra traffic and you think, actually, it's just not worth it. I'll go home. I have. 
I've definitely missed classes because I thought I was running so late, it was no longer worth my being there. And something that we really learned from working with these women was that it's always worth showing up. So long as it's not going to be a punitive thing where the instructor's going to punish you with push-ups for being late, you're always welcome to come into the class. We got way better participation by letting people know they could come in at any time that they wanted to. And this is something that I've taken into our practice today. I do a lot of education with my clients about if you're running late, you're human. I don't blame you. I want you to come. As a group, we'll take a moment. We'll regulate our nervous systems together. We'll do a grounding exercise. And then we'll continue on with the class. I would much rather you come along 20 minutes late than miss a class or any, at any time point. Um, so that's been something that I think has been really interesting to bring back into the work that we do. We haven't quite adopted this, but we also changed the structure uh, where we didn't run an initial consultation with this population. And part of that was time constraints. Part of it was also we didn't present it as a trauma-informed program because we thought that trying to explain that to people who don't see themselves as victims of trauma, even though they experience very regular police violence, gang violence, domestic violence, significant trauma, they wouldn't identify with that. And so we took away going through and explaining, here's how this trauma-informed program is going to work. And that's not necessarily something that I think we should do for the Western culture or for the Western context. But it means that when we've been able to do events like tomorrow, when we're going to run um, an open workshop and bring people along, that I have a different model where we can have open days and we can bring people in. We don't necessarily need to do that um, really structured intake. And we also ran this in an open air environment, which was necessary because that was the facilities we had access to, but it meant people didn't have privacy, so people walking past could see what they were doing. Um, but in terms of the safety of the community that we were working in, this actually ended up being a positive because they could see when police were coming towards them, which was um, a very real potential sign of danger. So we don't know everything about trauma-informed practice. I think we know so little about trauma, kind of think that we do. I like to think that some of the strategies that I've spoken about have improved access for women. We've worked with over 100 women and gender diverse people so far, and certainly that's the feedback we get, is that if it wasn't an inclusive, explicitly trauma-informed space, they would never have started kickboxing. So that's a win. But I'm very cognizant of, are we doing the right things in trauma-informed practice, and are all of our, de our ideas from the global north correct, and what can we continue to learn from the global south? So perhaps questions to chat about after this or in the, in the panel discussion to follow. We did write a paper about our work in El Salvador, and if anyone would like that, it is not yet um, published. It's under review, but you can email me. Um, I'll leave this up for a sec so people can take a picture, but I've put my email address on the um, next page if you want to email me and I can send it to you.